Okay, let's go. So well, I'd like to welcome everyone back to this uh, compassion practice program. And we're into the fifth and last session in this program. So let's have a look at what we'll be having uh, covering this evening's uh, session. This fifth session is titled uh, Tong Len, uh, giving and taking. It's a Tibetan word meaning giving and taking. And this again is the fifth of uh, five sessions in this compassion program. We were looking in the first three sessions, we were covering the four immeasurables, loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. And then the last session on Monday, we uh, building on the four immeasurables with this exchanging self with others uh, approach to cultivating bodhicitta. And we're going to continue with that in this session, in particular, focusing on the meditative practice called Tong Len. Before we start, let's begin with a short meditation just to settle body, speech and mind and setting a good motivation for this evening's session. So if you'd like to find a nice comfortable posture, let's begin. allowing your awareness to descend into the body. Simply becoming aware of sensations throughout the body. And if you notice any areas of tightness or tension in any part of the body, then use the out breath to relax and release that tightness or tension. Bringing your awareness to the area of your face and softening and relaxing all the muscles in the face. Mouth and jaw, soft and relaxed. And all the muscles around the eyes, soft and relaxed. In this way, allowing the entire body to become completely relaxed, completely at ease. And relaxing more deeply with each out breath. Allowing the breathing to settle into its natural rhythm. Simply allowing it to flow naturally and effortlessly. and setting the mind in a state of ease and relaxation. So not dwelling in the past, not anticipating the future, releasing all activities of the mind and simply allowing the mind to come to rest, to come to rest in the stillness of the present moment.
allowing the mind to remain relaxed, still and clear. And then setting a positive motivation for this evening's session. And again, try to make your motivation as expansive as possible. And if possible, setting the motivation or aspiration of bodhicitta. The aspiration for full awakening for the benefit of others. And then keeping this motivation in mind, we can slowly end this meditation and begin our discussions together here this evening. Let's have a look at what we'll be covering in this evening's session. We'll begin with a short review of some of the earlier points from the earlier sessions. Then we'll look at this Tong Len, giving and taking, look at the practice. We'll do a guided meditation of Tong Len. Then after the meditation, dispelling a few common misconceptions regarding this practice. We'll then look at how to apply this Tong Len practice in daily life. And then we'll look at how to integrate this compassion practice in general, all the various aspects in daily life. We'll then do a second Tonglen meditation, expanding out further. Then time for some question answer and we'll finish with dedication. So let's begin with a short review of some of the earlier points. And we saw there that in all Buddhist traditions, whether it's Theravada or Mahayana, we can talk about the two main wings of practice of Prajna and Upaya, or of often commonly referred to as the two wings of practice of wisdom and compassion. And we saw there at the foundation level exemplified by Theravada, then the wisdom wing of practice are uh, cultivating these three marks of existence, these insights into impermanence, suffering and no self. And the compassion wing, the core of this, uh, these four immeasurables often referred to as the four Brahma Viharas within Theravada traditions cultivating these four qualities of loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. And then in the Mahayana Buddhist traditions, we then build on both of those wings that in the wisdom wing, we build on that wing with the wisdom of emptiness. And we build on the compassion wing with this aspiration of bodhicitta that we briefly introduced in the last session. And we earlier looked at the importance of practicing both wings. Because often what happens is when people come into a spiritual path, they tend to gravitate to one or, 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 or the other of these two wings. That particularly in a lot of Buddhist traditions, there's a lot of emphasis on Vipassana or Vipassana. So often people gravitate to this practice, put a lot of effort into the Vipassana practice, but often neglect the compassion wing of practice. And then we get into trouble, often can get into trouble. That if we simply engage in Vipassana practice without grounding ourselves in compassion, then there's a, a danger that we can become very self-absorbed, uh, disconnected from others, even to the point of being insensitive to others suffering. And in extreme cases, even becoming very unethical thinking that now we're some high level Vipassana meditator. So everything I do is with wisdom so I can do whatever I want. And then often we see this 
uh, that, that people become very unethical, thinking that it's okay because there are it's with wisdom. But equally well, some people gravitate to compassion. They're much more resonate with compassion practice uh, and put a lot of effort into compassion practice, but often can neglect the wisdom side of the practice. And then often they can lose touch with reality in that we can become very biased in our compassion. We'll help certain people, but other people we don't like to help because they're horrible people. And then even with the best intention in the world, we can do things that not only don't help, but actually create more suffering because we don't know what we're, how to help. Uh, we, we don't have that wisdom. And then we can end up often with this compassion burnout, which actually earlier we saw was technically is not compassion burnout, it's empathy burnout. And then also many of us experienced that we try to help others and they take advantage of us. And so these are all classic examples of uh, what can happen if we only engage in the compassion wing of practice without adding wisdom. So therefore, to make sure that we are engaging in both wings of practice, to really have an effective approach to our spiritual path. Here in this uh, program, we're looking just at the compassion wing, but then we need to supplement that with the wisdom wing in our daily practice. And so here in the compassion training in this program, we saw the foundation where these four measurables, we looked at those in the first three sessions and together with uh, loving kindness in the first session, we looked at how to deal with attachment together with compassion in the second session, we looked at how to deal with anger. And then in the last, the last session we did, the fourth session, we were building on that foundation with this uh, exchanging self with others. One of the main techniques used to help us to cultivate this aspiration of bodhicitta. And within that approach, we'll be looking at specifically the Tong Len meditative practice in this session, and also a little bit later in this session, how to integrate all this compassion practice into daily life. And so this foundation of the four immeasurables, um, we often find, particularly in Tibetan Buddhism, that we have this four line uh, verse, this liturgy here that we use as a basis for cultivating these qualities. Uh, May all living beings have happiness in its causes, loving kindness. May they be free of suffering in its causes, which is compassion. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from suffering, empathetic joy. And then may they abide in equanimity, free of attachment and aversion to those near and far. That's the uh, fourth quality of equanimity. And we saw there that to cult we cultivate these qualities in stages, first beginning with ourself, then moving out to uh, our friends, then strangers, difficult people, and eventually towards all living beings. And that's what means the word immeasurable means here, that immeasurable loving kindness is loving kindness to immeasurable living beings. In other words, all living beings. And we saw also here earlier, the importance of having an integrated approach that we, if we cover all four of the four immeasurables, then that will help to deal with near what's called the near enemies. We saw there that each one of these four qualities has a near enemy, something that seems to be that quality, but actually is corrupting, is polluting, uh, interfering with that quality. For example, with loving kindness, attachment, we, it can simply degenerate into attachment. And if we see that, then equanimity can act as an antidote to that. Equanimity can also degenerate into simply equal indifference to others. There we find compassion acts an anti as an antidote to that indifference. Compassion can also degenerate into simply a state of despair. And the antidote to that is empathetic joy, focusing on the positive aspects. Empathetic joy uh, can also simply degenerate into sort of meaningless rejoicing. And an antidote to that is loving kindness. And so therefore, if we are co covering all four of these four immeasurables, then we'll, to a large extent, avoid each one of those four qualities degenerating into its near enemy or being polluted or corrupted by the near enemy. And then also in those first two sessions, we looked at how to deal with anger and attachment. 
And the approach we looked at there, we can apply to, in fact, all mental afflictions. And the first step there we saw was to have a clear understanding of the mental affliction, to understand how it disturbs us, how it really leads to suffering, to develop the aspiration, the wish to be free of it. Because for example, as long as we feel that actually attachment something useful or necessary, we're not going to want to eliminate it. So therefore to have a clear understanding of the mental affliction, what it is, how it leads to suffering, to develop the aspiration to be free of it. And then the next step is cultivating the view of genuine happiness through the preliminary practices to come to understand that the source of happiness and suffering is not anywhere out there in the world. Because as long as we think that our, our source of our happiness and suffering is coming from out there, then naturally we'll have attachment to pleasant things because it seems like they are the source of our happiness. We'll naturally have aversion to unpleasant things because they'll seem to be the source of our suffering. And then all the other mental afflictions come out of those. So therefore, um, by cultivating that view of genuine happiness, that is going to be essential in terms of a dealing with mental afflictions. And then actually how to deal with the mental afflictions when they arise, the first point, mindfulness is important. Um, and we cultivate mindfulness through the shamatha practice that we can simply, uh, we have a little window of opportunity when the mental affliction first arises before it takes control of our mind. And often we can't catch that window of opportunity. And we only realize we have a mental affliction uh, when it's too late, when it's already taking control of our mind. But if we cultivate mindfulness through shamatha practice, we'll notice that mental affliction arising much earlier when we're still in control of our mind. And then we can simply observe that mental affliction. And if we can observe the mental affliction, we're actually free of the mental affliction. It can't overwhelm us. It can't go anywhere. We don't need to fight with it. It will simply dissipate on its own. And then in addition to that, we saw also the benefit of applying antidotes to mental afflictions, particularly here from the Vipassana wing of practice. We saw there earlier, particularly these two insights into impermanence and emptiness uh, are very effective in dissolving any sorts of mental afflictions that arise in our mind. And so we can see here that if we really want to deal with mental afflictions, we really want to cultivate this compassion wing of practice, then the importance of this integrated approach that we need to cover all four bases of preliminary practices, shamatha, vipassana, and compassion. And if we engage in those four main areas of practice, then we'll have a very effective comprehensive uh, approach to practice in general, and specifically a very comprehensive approach in being able to effectively deal with mental afflictions such as attachment, anger, jealousy, craving, and so on. And then in the last session, we, we looked at how we build on the four immeasurables in the Mahayana traditions in terms of cultivating this bodhicitta, uh, this aspiration for enlightenment for the benefit of others. We saw there that this bodhicitta, the basis is renunciation. Renunciation being the wish for ourselves to be liberated from suffering. And on that basis, we can understand, well, we're not the only ones stuck in suffering and therefore to go on to develop the aspiration to free others from suffering as well. But to be able to effectively do that, we need to first achieve full awakening and therefore that is bodhicitta, the aspiration for enlightenment so that we can effectively help to liberate others from suffering. And that aspiration of bodhi, that bodhicitta has two types or two stages. Aspiring bodhicitta first, where we begin to cultivate this aspiration. And then on the basis of that aspiration, we engage in the practices that help us to move towards enlightenment, the six perfections. This is called engaging bodhicitta. But also we can talk about the two bodhicittas. Here, we're just simply talking about conventional bodhicitta, the aspiration for enlightenment for the benefit of others. But also we can talk about ultimate bodhicitta. And ultimate bodhicitta is the realization of emptiness that is sustained or supported with the motivation of bodhicitta, because it's these two together, which enables us to move along the various stages of the path to enlightenment. And we saw there in terms of cultivating bodhicitta, 
historically, there were two main methods used to help us to cultivate bodhicitta. The one that was most widely taught historically was the seven cause and effect method. And the one we have been focusing on mainly in the last session was the equalizing exchanging self with others, which historically was considered a little bit too difficult for the average person to implement. But I think this one is probably can be very, can be maybe the more powerful of the two in the modern world, because it directly addresses the self cherishing self centered attitude, which seems to be so prevalent and strong in the modern world. And the seven cause and effect method we saw could be problematic because inbuilt in that approach is an assumption of a belief in rebirth. And also um, having this, uh, seeing everyone as our mother, if we have difficulties with our mother, then that could be a bit of a, a stumbling block. But we went through those seven cause and effect method, seeing everyone as our mother, remembering their kindness on that basis, then developing a wish to repay their kindness that going on to developing the great loving kindness and great compassion, which is not just an aspiration or wish, but actively making a commitment or pledge to help mother sentient beings be free of suffering and placing them in happiness. And then building that further to altruistic intention, making it our personal responsibility to do so. And then understanding the only way we can implement that is if we ourselves achieve full awakening, hence, the, the seven step of bodhicitta. And then we went on to look at this equalizing and exchanging self with others to um, exchange the selfish self-centered self -centered attitude for an attitude of cherishing others. Also helps us to transform our attachment and aversion into loving kindness and compassion. And we saw here that this approach uh, has, a, it's a five step process that we go through. The first one was this equalizing self with others. And then on that basis, we engage in step two and three, reflecting on the disadvantages of self-cherishing and then re reflecting on the advantages of cherishing others. And then on that basis, developing the aspiration or wish therefore to exchange the selfish self-cherishing self attitude with an attitude of cherishing others, which is step four. And then to supplement that, a very powerful meditative practice called Tong Len, giving and taking, which we'll be uh, describing shortly. But first, let's go through the first four steps again, briefly. First step, equalizing self with others. We tend to put ourselves above others. I'm more important than others. My happiness is more important than others. And we can equalize ourselves, put ourselves at the same level in terms of understanding we all want to be happy, we all want to be free of suffering, they're all equal in this regard. And then on that basis, to then reflect on the disadvantages of this self cherishing attitude. And remember, self cherishing is nothing to do with uh, feeling self confidence or feeling good about ourselves, but rather self cherishing is this self centered selfish attitude which sees my happiness as more important than the happiness of anyone else. This sort of me first attitude. I'm number one. I'm the most important person on this planet. And if we have this attitude, we saw there, we often then become obsessed about me and my suffering, which can lead to a lot of fear and anxiety about the world. It become, can become very stress, stressful. We can become very hypersensitive and also by in terms of then trying to protect ourselves from all that supposed suffering out there, uh, we can end up with a lot of isolation and loneliness. And equally, we can then become very obsessed about me and my happiness. And that can lead to a lot of craving for things, frustration when we don't get them, dissatisfaction when they don't live up to our expectations. And then with this me first attitude, we have this exaggerated sense of self-importance which then often means we often show a lack, a lack of consideration and respect for others. Also often leads to a lot of jealousy, competitiveness, and we often can become very arrogant and dismissive towards others. And then with this me first attitude, we'll even go to the extent of harming others who stand in the way of our happiness. And as we saw earlier also with this me first attitude, we have a very biased attitude to people because we only see people from the perspective of 
how they affect me and my happiness. Then we end up with attachment to friends because they seem to be the source of our happiness. We have a lot of apathy and indifference to strangers because they don't seem to affect me in any way. And then a lot of hostility, anger and hatred to difficult people because they seem to be causing me suffering. Which means that with this me first attitude, it becomes extremely difficult to develop any genuine, pure loving kindness and compassion towards anyone. Because loving kindness and compassion to strangers, not really, because I couldn't care less what happens to them. Loving kindness and compassion to the so-called enemy, no way. In fact, I hope they suffer. They deserve to suffer because they're trying to harm me. And loving kindness and compassion to friends, okay, but only as long as they keep saying and doing things that make me happy, otherwise not. Um, so therefore, these are some of the disadvantages of this me first self-centered attitude. And then together with that, to reflect on the advantages of cherishing others. And we saw there that the advantages are just the flip side of the disadvantages of the uh, self-cherishing attitude. That if we're cherishing others, looking out for others' welfare, we won't be obsessed about me and my suffering, which means we won't have all this fear and anxiety, stress and loneliness. We won't be obsessed about me and my happiness. So we won't have all this craving, frustration and dissatisfaction. We won't have an exaggerated sense of self-importance. We will be showing consideration and respect for others. We'll be trying to help others as much as, up, as we can, rather than just simply being jealous, competitive and arrogant towards others. And we certainly will not be deliberately harming others in the pursuit of our happiness. And we'll be much more easy be able to develop genuine loving kindness and compassion to all. And then these two points, two and three, the disadvantages of self-cherishing, advantages of cherishing others, it was very nicely summarized by Shanti Deva, the great Indian eighth century master in his classic text, the Bodhisattva Charya Avatara. He says, whatever joy there is in the world all comes from desiring others to be happy. And whatever suffering there is in the world all comes from desiring myself to be happy. And so this is very nicely capsulated here that self-cherishing is just a source of suffering. Cherishing others is a source of happiness. But we saw there that cherishing others means that to effectively do that, we need to make sure we add wisdom. Because if we try to cherish others without wisdom, then probably we're going to get taken advantage of and we'll suffer. And we'll think this cherishing others doesn't work because I'm suffering all the time. Cherishing others always works. What's not working is the lack of wisdom. So rather than giving up this compassion and cherishing others, we just need to add wisdom and not tolerate any negative behavior to, of others towards us, any trying to, for them to try to take advantage of us. And then ex exchanging then on those two and three, the fourth point in daily life, then based on that understanding of point two and three, then whenever we notice self-cherishing coming up in daily life, to exchange that, to replace that with an attitude of cherishing others as much as possible, but not to allow, not to stop helping others, even if we have some residual selfishness. Because particularly as a beginner, it's very difficult to help others with a completely unselfish attitude. So if we're trying to help others, and we see that we have quite a very selfish motivation. Maybe we're wanting something in return or wanting to people to think we're someone special or so forth, then try to um, reduce that as much as possible. But even if there is a little bit of residual selfishness there, still engage in helping others. And then over time, you'll be able to reduce that even more. And so that's a practical way of going from being completely selfish to completely unselfish. And then that brings us to the fifth point, the main topic for this evening, and that is Tong Len. Tong Len is a Tibetan word, literally means giving and taking. And it's a, it's a meditative practice. And it's basically the giving and taking is we imagine taking on the sufferings of others and we imagine giving our happiness away to them. And this is a very powerful method to transform self-cherishing into cherishing others, to transform attachment and aversion into loving kindness and compassion. 
because the last thing the selfish me first attitude would want to do would be to take on any suffering from anyone. And the last thing that the selfish self-centered attitude would want to do would be to give away any happiness to anyone. So by imagining doing that, it's really um, destroying this selfish self-centered attitude and increasing the mind of cherishing others, increasing the mind of loving kindness and compassion. Now this practice, similar to the earlier practices, we do it in stages that we first start with ourself, particularly if we uh, have low self-esteem or self-hatred, not, not feeling kind or compassionate toward ourselves. Then expand out to friends because the most easy, comfortable there, move out to strangers. Once we're comfortable there, move out to the difficult people and eventually to all living beings. Now this practice is very much recommended to conjoin it with the breath, meaning to take suffering on the in-breath give happiness on the out breath. By conjoining with the breath, it helps us to stay focused. Um, now there are two approaches here to the visualization. Or as we saw earlier in, in, in the case of loving kindness and compassion, if you find that the visualization doesn't really help, um, we can leave it out here as well. But I'll just describe the two approaches to the visualization, and then we'll, we'll do a practice based on one of those. Now, often in Tibetan Buddhism, the more classic visualization you have for the first part of the meditation, which is the taking, is the taking of suffering, is that we, as we did earlier with the compassion, let's say we have a person in front of us, and we're going to do the taking the suffering. So we, again, we imagine, for example, their suffering in the form of black smoke filling their body. And then the more traditional way that it's often explained in Tibetan Buddhism is particularly when we're learning the practice is then, then on the in-breath, imagine taking that black smoke of suffering out of their body and use a number of breaths to keep taking it out and out and out and imagine it, it forms in a little cloud here in front of your face, a little cloud. And once you've taken all the smoke out, all the suffering, the smoke of suffering out of that body, their body, the next step is imagining the selfish self-centered attitude as a small black rock in the center of your chest. And then imagine breathing in that black smoke, it goes down, it touches the black rock of self-cherishing and they're both completely destroyed. The symbolism there is it's the willingness to take suffering that destroys self-cherishing. So that's the symbolism. Now, I think particularly in our modern world, there can be potentially uh, some dangers of doing this, this visualization because in our modern world, we have this uh, obsessive focus on the negative, and we do that with cognitive fusion. And so what can happen is if we're doing a lot of cognitive fusion, then when we have the block, black rock of self-cherishing, we identify with that and think, oh, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I'm so bad. And then we take the smoke on and we punish ourselves with the smoke. And we hold on to that smoke and punish ourselves because I'm such a bad person, I'm so selfish. So this is not the practice. Um, and so therefore, I prefer to use the other visualization, the one we used earlier in the compassion practice, that is, instead of visualizing the black rock of self-cherishing, we visualize the light of inner purity of mind, our Buddha nature in the center of our heart, and then breathing in the smoke and imagine the smoke comes in and gets dissolved in that light, because here that Buddha nature is our inner wisdom and it's wisdom which destroys mental afflictions and suffering. So that's the symbolism there. And that's the visualization that we're going to be doing in the Tonglen meditation we're about to do. But there is the more classic approach. If you find that very effective, then you're quite welcome. If you're already familiar with the Tonglen practice, then you're quite welcome to use that visualization. Or if you found in the earlier uh, practices of loving kindness and compassion that the visualization didn't really help or you found it difficult it was just another distraction 
then we can do also do the Tong Len practice without visualizing. Just imagine taking the suffering and it's dissolved and imagining giving the happiness away to them. So then the meditation we're going to do, which I've just described, here we have the points. Again, we'll begin by imagining that inner purity of mind, our Buddha nature in the form of uh, white light in the center of our chest. Imagine the person in front of us. We'll start with ourselves first though. Um, and then we'll do the taking in terms of compassion, the, the aspiration, and then imagining that person's mental afflictions and suffering in the form of black smoke. Then on the in-breath, breathing it in, coming down, touching the, uh, being dissolved in the white light, continuing to do that a number of times. And then imagine they're now completely free of the mental afflictions and suffering. And then the second part is the giving, is with loving kindness, is the aspiration that may they have happiness in its causes. And on the out breath, again, imagine the white light of loving kindness radiating out from that sphere of light at your heart, entering the person's body uh, and transforming into whatever that person needs to be happy in the short term and the long term. And then we do that over a number of breaths and then eventually imagine they've now found the genuine happiness that they seek. And so we'll do that practice now. And we'll do, we'll start with ourselves first. And then we'll do a second step of going out to the friend. And then in the second meditation, a little bit later, we'll go out further from, from there as well. But let's do that Tonglen meditation now. If you'd like tonight, find a nice comfortable posture. Let's begin. setting your body into a state of relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. and relaxing more deeply with each out breath. And with each out breath, letting go of any thoughts that may have arisen, happily releasing them. And allowing the mind to come to rest come to rest in the present moment. Resting in stillness. Tong Len is a Tibetan word which means giving and taking. And it's a very powerful meditation to transform the selfish, self centered attitude into an attitude of cherishing others, to transform our attachment and aversion 
into loving kindness and compassion. And we can begin by using this Tong Len practice to cultivate loving kindness and compassion for ourselves and then expand out to others. And we can begin by imagining the inner purity of our mind, a level of our mind untouched by any of the mental afflictions. To imagine this inner purity of your mind in the form of a small white radiant sphere of light at the center of your chest, at the level of your heart. And then arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if I were free of suffering and its causes. May I be free of all suffering and its causes. May I be free of all mental afflictions. And then imagine your mental afflictions and suffering in the form of black smoke filling your body. And then with each in-breath, imagine drawing that black smoke into the sphere of light at your heart, completely dissolving it there. So with each in-breath, breathe in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing your mental afflictions and suffering at your heart, dissolving it into your inner wisdom, inner purity of your mind. And then imagine the black cloud is now completely extinguished. And now you're completely free of all mental afflictions and suffering. And simply rest in that freedom, rest in that purity of mind. And then arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if I had happiness in its causes. May I be truly well and happy. And then with each out breath, imagine rays of light radiating out from the sphere of light at your heart, filling and saturating your entire body and mind. Imagining the light transforms into everything you need to be happy. So with each out breath, breathe out the light of loving kindness, sending to yourself whatever you need to be happy, both in the short term and the long term.
and then imagine you've now found the genuine happiness that you seek. And rest in that state of inner well being, inner purity of mind. And just as you wish to be happy and be free of suffering, so does everyone else. So next bring to mind someone close to you, a loved one who's currently experiencing some sort of physical or mental problem or suffering. And imagine them very clearly in front of you. and arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if they're free of that problem, free of that suffering. May you be free of all suffering and its causes. And then imagine their problem or suffering in the form of black smoke filling their body. And then with each in-breath, imagine drawing that black smoke out of their body and bringing it into the sphere of light at your heart, completely dissolving it there. So with each in-breath, breathe in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing their suffering at your heart. And then imagine the black cloud is now completely extinguished. And now they're completely free of that problem, free of that suffering. And take delight in this. And then arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if they had happiness in its causes. May you be truly well and happy. And then with each out breath, imagine rays of light radiating out from the sphere of light at your heart and filling their entire body and mind. Imagining it transforms into everything they need to be happy. So with each out breath, breathe out the light of loving kindness, sending to them whatever they need to be happy, both in the short term and the long term.
and then imagine they've now found the genuine happiness that they seek. And take delight in this. And we can bring the meditation to a close. Let's look at now some misconception or doubts that could arise in this practice. That sometimes people have this doubt, if I'm doing this, for example, with someone with a very serious illness, will I get their illness? And the answer is no, you can't actually take their physical illness from them because it's a mental exercise. And then when that's answered that way, then people go, well, if I, actually, if I can't actually take any physical illnesses from anyone, then what's the point of doing this practice? The point of the practice is that you are the main beneficiary of this practice, that Tong Len helps to reduce our self-centeredness and increase our mind of loving kindness and compassion. But how then does it help others? It helps others in two ways. It helps others indirectly in that if we do this practice effectively, it means that in daily life, we're more likely to help others and more likely to help them in a genuine way. Because sometimes when we help others, in daily life, we often have a little bit of our own agenda. Like, I know what's best for you. You better do like this, like I want you to do, rather than helping them for their sake. And then also, um, particularly if we have a connection with the person we're doing with it, and I think there might be some scientific evidence to support this, is that we can have a direct, subtle, positive impact on that person's mind, even if they're on the other side of the planet due to the interdependent nature of reality. So um, this is how we can benefit others, is that we are the main beneficiary of this practice. It will help to reduce our self-centeredness. It will help to reduce our increase our mind of loving kindness and compassion. Therefore, we will be able to help others uh, more willingly, more effectively with less um, of our own uh, agenda, more purely. How to apply this Tonglen practice in daily life. Once we've become familiar with this Tonglen practice, we can, pra we can do it on one breath. On the in-breath, take suffering. On the out-breath, give happiness, which means we can do this practice all day long. For example, when we see others suffering in daily life, if it's obvious they're having some mental or physical suffering, then on one breath, in-breath, take their suffering. On the out-breath, give them happiness. We can do this all day long. And then we, when we ourselves are suffering, then the first thing to do is practice acceptance, meaning not to go, oh, no, no, I don't want, go away, go away. That's a version that just magnifies. And so to practice acceptance, we can use advice here from Shanti Deva. He says, if a situation can be remedied, why get upset? Just fix it. And if a situation cannot be remedied, what's the use in getting upset? Doesn't help, it'll pass. So on the basis of practicing acceptance, we won't magnify our suffering, but then we can use that suffering as a meaningful, a, a, a meaningful uh, situation. For example, let's say we're having a migraine headache. If we go, oh no, not the migraine headache, go away, that will magnify our suffering. So we just accept and go, okay, I've got a migraine headache. And through my experience, even if I take medication doesn't help, it'll pass eventually. That's acceptance. In addition to that, we can go, okay, well, I'm not the only person on the planet who has a migraine headache right now. There must be thousands of other people with migraine headaches at the moment, and maybe much worse than me. So by me willingly accepting my migraine headache, may all others be free of theirs. So we take on their suffering, we give them happiness. So we can use that uh, suffering situation to cultivate loving kindness and compassion for others. And then also, 
we can use this when we're meeting a difficult person. If we're, for example, about to enter into a meeting and we anticipate the person's going to be very aggressive towards us, then often we're on the defensive and then they may say some little provocative thing and we react with out of that. So rather than that, as we're physically approaching that person, then we can take their mental afflictions away from them and give them happiness and then shift our perspective as well. Trying to imagine the situation, how that person would see the situation as well. That's also going to be very, very helpful. So these are a couple of examples of how we can use Tonglen in daily life situations. Let's now look at how to integrate this compassion training or practice in general into daily life. Always good to start the day with a great motivation and hear the one I like from Dalai Lama is every day, think as you wake up, I'm going to benefit others as much as I can. Then to do the daily meditation first thing in the morning, a good way to start the day. We can start with some shamatha practice to one of those variations we did earlier, either the breath, the mind, awareness, to really calm and focus the mind but to have an integrated approach. We saw the importance of having an integrated approach. And so in the morning, if we're meditating a bit longer, maybe 45 minutes, we can break that into two sessions, two 20 minute sessions. So then the, the first session we can do shamatha, the second session we can do one of the other areas of practice, the analytical tile, style of meditations, either maybe preliminary practice and compassion practice or vipassana practice. If we're only doing one session in the morning, then some mornings we may just do just shamatha. On others, we do a little bit of um, shamatha and then the rest of the session is analytical. We need an integrated approach. What to meditate on in the analytical in, in terms of preliminaries, compassion, vipassana. I think here we can be flexible and use what is helpful given our current situation in our life. If we find that we're being very lazy when it comes to meditating or we're too busy to meditate, excellent time to focus on the preliminaries, particularly precious human life and death. If we're suffering from a lot, a lot of low self-esteem, uh, anger or self-hatred, then loving kindness and compassion. Can't go wrong there. If we're finding we're caught up in a lot of jealousy, a lot of despair, empathetic joy, excellent practice. If we find we have a lot of grasping and attachment, then one of the passion of practices of impermanence or emptiness. So we can adjust, use those according to what's going on in our life, but to really have this integrated approach. Then what to do during the day. And here we had in an earlier session, um, this quote from Viktor Frankl, who said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And so here, we tend to be in daily life stimulus reaction machines. Some stimulus comes based on habit, we react. And we often don't react in a very good way. We need to change that. There's a little space between when stimulus comes to when we react. That space, we need to, to be able to get that window of opportunity. We need mindfulness. So we need to continue to cultivate mindfulness, to seed the day with mindfulness, um, do, using tri various triggers to remind ourselves to be mindfulness and do short mindfulness exercises throughout the day, focusing, for example, on the breath for three short breaths, maybe once an hour or so, using triggers like such as app, mindfulness apps and so forth. And then to really um, get into this witnessing mode that we saw in earlier shamatha practice, this open awareness, to be able to have that space there, to be able to choose our response instead of react, to notice what stimulus is coming our way. And then in simply, instead of reacting out of habit, then to respond using loving kindness and compassion instead of a, attachment and aversion. And as we saw, we can use this Tong Len practice throughout the day, when we see others suffering, when ourselves are suffering, when we're faced with difficult situations, Tong Len, very good thing to do. And then we saw also in an earlier session, the importance of focusing on the positives, that we have this obsessive focus on the negative and together with often with cognitive fusion. Therefore, whenever we see others doing good things or having good results to really be happy for that, rejoice in that behavior, 
or when we do something good to rejoice in our good behavior and then also to focus on the on the things that we receive during the day and have this sense of gratitude to really focus on the positives to have really a balanced view um, and as as um what was his name uh, modern day philosopher william james said for the moment what we attend to is our reality so to really focus on the positives is very important to have a balanced view of ourselves and others to inspire ourselves to go further in daily life and then at the end of the day if you have time you can do a second meditation in the evening so if you're doing one meditation in the morning one in the evening what I recommend is do the shamatha in the morning because we're most calm there and that's best time to do shamatha. Maybe in the evening a little bit uh, tired, we need a, maybe a little bit more a stimulating motivation, um, a meditation rather, so analytical meditation in the evening. So maybe one of the preliminary practices, the Tong Len practice, the Vipassana practice. And also uh, if we're fi uh, particularly fatigued in the evening, we want to meditate, use the Shavasana posture, very good. And then when we go to bed, as I've mentioned a number of times now, go into the Shavasana posture, lie down, review your day, pick one negative thing, one not so good thing you did during the day, have some regret, reliance, meaning reaffirm positive direction in life, practical remedy, think of some practical remedy for that, make a strong determination, resolve not to do it again the following day. That will weaken negative behavior. Equally important, maybe even more important, pick one positive thing we did during the day, rejoice in that behavior, make a strong determination to continue to do it. Pick one thing we received during the day, have gratitude. And then transitioning to sleep. In the Shavasana posture, on the out breath, particularly if we've had a hectic, busy day and our mind is, uh, is buzzing and our body is agitated, then releasing tension in the body, releasing thoughts in the mind, just keep doing that. On every out breath, when you get to drowsy, you mentally note your meditation is now finished and then you physically move out of that Shavasana posture into whatever posture you use for sleep. That's a very good way to transition into uh, sleep from daily life. So that's a little bit of how to integrate into daily life. What I'd like to do now before we go to question and answer is another Tonglen meditation. So we'll move out now um, into stranger and then we'll go out from there. Find a nice comfortable posture. Let's do that meditation. As always, we begin by preparing the body. So establishing a good posture, keeping the back nice and straight. And at the same time, allow the entire body to become completely relaxed, completely at ease. allowing the breathing to settle into its natural rhythm. Simply allowing it to flow naturally and effortlessly. and allowing the mind to come to rest in the stillness of the present moment.
And we can begin the Tonglen practice by imagining the inner purity of our mind, our inner wisdom, in the form of a small white radiant sphere of light in the center of our chest at the level of our heart. And then bring to mind someone who you know well, but is neither a friend nor someone who you dislike. And imagine them very clearly in front of you. They're just like yourself in wanting to be happy and wanting to be free of suffering. And so arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if they are free of suffering in its causes. May you be free of all suffering in its causes. May you be free of all mental afflictions. And imagining their mental afflictions and suffering in the form of black smoke filling their body. And with each in-breath, imagine drawing that black smoke out of their body and bringing it into the sphere of light at your heart, completely dissolving it there. So with each in-breath, breathe in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing their mental afflictions and suffering at your heart. And then imagine they're now, the black cloud is now completely extinguished. And now they're completely free of all mental afflictions and suffering. And take joy in this. And then arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if they had happiness in its causes. May you be truly well and happy. And with each out breath, imagine rays of light radiating out from your heart, filling their body and mind and transforming into everything they need to be happy. And so with each out breath, breathe out the light of loving kindness, sending to them whatever they need to be happy, both in the short term and the long term. and imagine they've now found the genuine happiness that they seek. 
and take delight in this. And now allow your field of loving kindness and compassion to expand out further and allow your mind to move around. And whoever comes to mind, whether it's a friend, a stranger, or even a difficult person, attend to them. May you be free of all suffering and its causes. And may you be truly well and happy. And breathing in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing their suffering at your heart and breathing out the light of loving kindness, sending to them whatever they need to be happy. Allow your mind to continue to move around. Whoever comes to mind, whether it's an individual or even a group of people, attend to them. Breathing in with compassion, breathing out the light of loving kindness. No matter how much darkness is drawn in, it is all extinguished without a trace. And no matter how much light is sent out, it is sent out from an inexhaustible source that is in no way depleted. Breathing in with compassion, breathing out the light of loving kindness, allowing the mind to continue to move around. Whoever comes to mind, attend to them.
and then release all appearances and allow the mind to come to rest. To rest in the inner purity of mind, which is in the nature of loving kindness and compassion. And we can bring the meditation to a close. You have any questions there, Miffy? Uh, yeah, we do. We've got a couple of really good ones from Deepa, actually. So oh. um, the first one that she asked is that it often takes her 20 to 30 minutes to really get into her meditation, just to focus and relax. Mm -hmm. So has she just created bad habits of not controlling her mind enough from the beginning of the meditation? Um, well, there's, the, there's degrees of getting into the meditation. I mean, the important thing is to prepare well at the beginning of the meditation. So if we don't prepare well, and then we sit down and we just try and do like a shamatha practice, then it's probably not going to go very well uh, to start with. It may take some time. So we need, that's why it's important to go through the preparation, preparing body, speech and mind well but also to set a good motivation for the meditation, not just to jump into the meditation. And then I think also if it's, for example, a shamatha meditation, to really understand the two imbalances of like laxity and excitation, and to really notice, to, do, to correct them as soon as they arise, don't sort of let them take control of the mind and then eventually sort of get around to uh, dealing with them. So I think it's important to, to, do, to do those sorts of things, to have a chance of getting into the meditation. And also um, that we can do at the beginning of the meditation as part of the preparation, that sort of breathing exercise which can also help to let go of any negativities that often we come into the meditation world with. So don't, don't, don't cut the med preparation short, take as much time as you need to prepare. If you find just, if you find that if you take the time to prepare well, and some meditations, it may, you may be able to prepare very quickly and others, it may take longer, then you'll find, I think you'll start to get into the meditation a little bit more quickly. Okay. Um, and then there's a follow on question um, from Deepa as well. Then is it okay to change the object of meditation within one sitting, for example, from awareness of awareness to focusing on, focusing on sensations of breathing, if our mind's getting too distracted and then going back to awareness of awareness? Yeah, very good question. In general, if we're doing shamatha practice, then we pick an object and focus on that. But it was a good point mentioned in the question there is that let's say we're um, focusing on the mind, but our, we're getting completely distracted, then you may find that temporarily to shift back into the body to anchor yourself in the breath. And once you find yourself more relaxed and stable, then go back to observing the mind. So you can use that as like a backup strategy. So yes, you can use another object as a, like a temporary backup strategy and use it when necessary to, to ground yourself to go then go back to the object. But just say doing five minutes of this, five minutes of that, five minutes of that, uh, that in one session, I think would be counterproductive. But yes, you can use uh, other objects in Shamata as a temporary backup strategy when, when, if and when necessary. Great, that's brilliant. Um, then also, um, you mentioned a really interesting way of going to sleep, um, which I'm hoping I'll be able to do. I was also wondering, is there a way, a, a similar way of how to wake up when you're waking up in the morning? Well, 
also in the middle of the night, if you wake up in the middle of the night, then often what happens is if we don't immediately go back to sleep, then we go, oh, I've got to get back to sleep. I've got to get back to sleep. I've got to work tomorrow. I've got to sleep. I've got to sleep. And then we get all agitated and then we don't sleep. So therefore, if you find you're waking up in the middle of the night and you don't quickly fall back to sleep, then go back into this Shavasana posture and then do the same, just on every out breath, releasing any tension in the body, releasing any thoughts in the mind. And you'll probably find you'll get very drowsy quickly and then go back to sleep. And even if you don't, you're getting a lot of the, the rest and benefits from sleep anyway, rather than just lying there getting frustrated and agitated and worried about not sleeping. And then I think the in the morning, um, the you know, to really uh, to 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 wake up. I mean, in terms of posture, I don't think we need to, I mean, you could if you wanted to move straight into a meditative uh, practice from sleep, um, particularly a sort of shamatha, you could, as, as you're sort of waking up, go back into the shavasana posture and just continue with that. So you could do that in terms of the uh, morning practice. If you, uh, if you particularly if you use shav shavasana posture uh, as a, a meditation posture, you could do that. You could just stay um, in that Shavasana posture and then go into that. But I think it would be important then as part of the motivation to uplift the mind, to make the mind bright and alert um, from the sleep state. So you may think of something inspiring or having, you know, or or if you're, if you're familiar in the Tibetan Buddhism and you have a, a guru or a deity, you may imagine white light streaming into your body from, from your guru, from your teacher, from the deity to, to really uh, invigorate the mind. So I think that also very helpful in the morning. Um, so there, you seem to make quite an emphasis between um, resting and then noticing when you get drowsy and making that mental note, I'm getting drowsy now and the meditation's ended that's really tricky <laughs> yeah because the thing is here we want to be able to use the shavasana posture for meditation yeah so if you're using that posture for sleeping and meditating then we're going to get confused and so we won't have that mental association that's why often when people first use the shavasana posture for meditation they get very drowsy quickly because their mental association is when the body's horizontal it's sleep time but if, if you use the Shavasana posture only for meditation, then you'll build up the mental association that this particular horizontal position means meditate. Uh, therefore, it's important if you're transitioning to sleep to make that mental distinction between meditation and sleep, because otherwise, again, you'll... So, um, you know, you can use that. And when you start to get a little bit drowsy, just mentally note, okay, my meditation's finished, and then physically move out of that posture. Right, yep. Um, then Deepa, uh, also just to clarify on that first question, she finds that um, the distractions tend to subside naturally after 20 or 30 minutes. So does she let her mind just wander slightly and not to try and control it too tightly at the beginning, like how to calibrate it? Yeah, it, it, it's a very good question. There's a, there's a difference between fighting with the mind and just letting go of distractions. So we're not trying to we're not trying to constrict the mind when we when we have distractions. We're just letting it go and coming back, letting it go and coming back, letting go and come back. And you may find that initially, particularly if you have a generally a very active mind, you may find it, it takes some time for it to settle down, but that's okay. As long as we're not thinking, oh, a little bit of distraction is okay. I'll, I'll start by allowing a little bit of wandering and then eventually I'll sort of stop it. That's not a good habit to get into. Uh, equally well, it's not a good habit to get into to try and constrict the mind, to tighten the mind. Simply, uh, uh, happily and patiently every time the mind wanders notice that and just come back come back come back come back come back patiently gently just keep doing that because if we allow the mind to wander a bit and we go oh, I'll, I'll do a little bit of wandering because eventually it'll settle down 
then that's again not a good habit to get into because then we're allowing the mind to be the in control and we're not reducing the habit of mind wandering so just patiently and gently keep coming back keep coming back and you may find after 15 or 20 minutes the mind really starts to settle down because all of that energy that you had is dissipating of wanting to go off onto things is dissipating so that's okay yes great thank you okay i think we've run out of time yep. there. um so let's dedicate before we run away I'll just get the screen up again. And let's dedicate then not just this session this evening, but this whole compassion program um, based on the Shanti Deva dedication prayer. So if you'd like to just listen or you can read along as well the dedication prayer from Shanti Deva. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are warm with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Thank you.